Hey folks, John Thompson, Spring Framework Guru. So in the last module, we looked at setting active profiles and unit testing, which is all and good, but we actually need to do this at runtime. And Spring actually offers a number of different ways to set the, the active profile at runtime. And what I want to do is run through some of those examples. I'm going to look at this in a Spring Boot context and how we can set the active profile under Spring Boot and in a Spring environment. And we're actually going to use IntelliJ too to set a, an active profile. And what I have here is a real simple example. I have several different beans with different profiles on them. And I'm using a little trick. I'm taking the Java constructor, setting a no arg constructor to do some system out messages. So the output gets set to the console so we can see the output from the bean. So let me jump over to IntelliJ now. I'm going to review what I've written and then we'll go through working with setting the active profile so we can see how at runtime, when we run the application, how we can change the active profile and different beans will get wired into the Spring context and brought up for us. Okay, I've added a few classes to our Spring Boot project here. And this time I'm actually using the in the main directory under main Java. So these are actual classes that'll get compiled into the Spring project and run under Tomcat when we run in the context. Previous examples I was doing under test, so those aren't included in the in the war file that gets deployed. Or the the Spring Boot jar, depending on how we want to deploy this thing. So the first thing I have under Bootstrap, I created a new package called Profile Sysout. And really, this is just designed to provide some system out messages in the console for us to see what profile is being active. Wouldn't normally do this in production type system, but this is more for educational purposes so we can see these messages in the context of this course. So I have a default one. And just like before, we have dev, uh, QA, and prod. So right now I don't have any active profile set, so I'm expecting that the default profile will get picked up and we'll see that in the console as it goes by. So I'm gonna bring this up a little bit. Now we can see that we're up and running now, but I did not get any console output. So take a look, there's nothing there. I should see a bunch of, bunch of signs. And what happened was, is let me show you exactly. We can see that we have default here. I thought we could see right at the beginning here with the active profiles. So yeah, right here, second line, no active profile set falling back to default, default profiles and default. And notice that it's lowercase and I have it set to uppercase. So the, the profiles are actually case sensitive. I'm going to re restart this now so we can see that the default profile gets picked up. Now we can see the message right there in the council just scrolled by that default is actually the default profile and this being the default profile sysout being is getting wired into the spring context because that system out is going to occur when spring creates this being and has it into the context. And just to, to reiterate, it's doing it because I've marked this class with the at component annotation and it has the profile default and it is in a package that Spring is doing a component scan on. So Spring is going to bring it into the context for us. Now, the way that the, the primary way we want to set profiles within Spring, or Spring Boot, I should say, is in the application profiles, is within the application properties file under resources. So let's go in there. And what we can do here is IntelliJ has some nice autocomplete here. And this is the property Spring Profiles Active. And you can see it's expecting a common separated list of active profiles. And this is important. This is a common Spring property. And this dovetails nicely into what we've said in the past. If you remember the properties, how they're externalized, remember that there's a hierarchy. And this is in the application properties file. This is one of the last things that Spring is going to look at for for the property. And this time let's set it to dev. I'm going to set it to dev here and I'm going to restart this. Now we can see the, the dev profile is active. We just saw that scroll by. Let's go scroll back up here so we can see it. So the dev profile is active because I set that into the application.properties. Now I'm going to show you another way in IntelliJ. What we can do is come up here I'm going to go to edit configurations and right here we have active profiles. 
And what IntelliJ is doing in the background for us, it's actually going to pass in a command line parameter to set the active profile for us. This is just a utility that IntelliJ provides for us to set that. And if you remember before when we were talking about the hierarchy of properties, the uh, application.properties file is one of the last things that it's going to look at. And command line arguments take a higher precedence. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to restart it now. And just to, to reiterate, I set it to QA and we can see that QA scrolled by. So now you can see that the in the top part of the screen there, I have Spring Profiles Active Dev, but because I set that in IntelliJ, which gets passed in as a command line argument, it gets picked up. So QA overrides Dev. Okay, so another thing that we can do here is we can use an environment property. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. We can do this right in IntelliJ again. So I'm gonna to come to Edit Configurations, and this time I'm gonna get rid of the QA Active Profile. And this time I wanna set an environment variable. So I'm gonna come up here, click on Environment Variables, and I'm gonna add one, and I'm gonna call it spring.profiles.active. And this time I'm gonna set it to prod. So we can see that spring profiles active equals prod. I'm going to say okay to that. Now we can see that the prod profile is active and scroll back up so that we can see that on the screen. So even though I have dev on line eight here set as active profile, but that's in the application.properties file because I set a, a system environment variable for spring profiles active that got overridden at runtime by the prod profile being active. So what I showed you here, so within the Spring Boot application.properties file, we can set an active profile in that. And that is kind of the default way to do that. And if you remember, we talked about the hierarchy of properties and active profiles is just a property within Spring to tell Spring which profiles are active. And that hierarchy does kick in. So I showed you a couple different ways to override that. And one is through IntelliJ, which I'm pretty sure in the background is giving a command line parameter. And then the other is by setting a system environment variable. And th this is very important when we're deploying things in the, the enterprise, because we might deploy this jar. We might This jar might go through our build server and get deployed to a development environment. And we'll be using the properties out of that properties file, the application.properties file for a development environment. And then our DevOps people might take that that same jar and deploy it to QA or production, but now they're gonna specify a different profile to be active. And they'll do that by setting either environment variable or passing in a command line parameter. There's actually a couple different options. If you remember that we, we looked at the whole hierarchy of properties, Spring does offer us a pretty robust toolbox, but at the bottom of the food chain, we gotta remember is the application.profiles file where we set things in there and everything above it is going to override it. So this gives us a handy way to generate a, an artifact. Spring Boot by default does a executable jar that will get produced and we might have a, a continuous integration server such as Jenkins running that to produce that jar. And then our operations folks are going to promote that jar through the different environments. And it's very common in enterprise development to have segregation of duties. For example, I worked for a, a large credit card company. They their name begins with a V. Should be able to figure out who they are, but I never would even see access to a QA system because, as a developer, because of segregation of duties, I don't get to see that. But now they have, in this example, they'd have a deployable artifact that the operations people can override properties on as it gets migrated through the various environments. And me, as a developer, I'm not there, not required to be setting property strings and things like that. And You'll see this a lot in enterprise development, especially in financial services or healthcare where there's a lot of restrictions and, and large organizations, there is gonna be a segregation of duties like this. And there'll be needs to have that common artifact deployed through. So if you're going through PCI compliance or SOX compliance or something like that, this becomes more and more important to have that common artifact go through. So this is an example that I'm trying to show you here of how that artifact can have property set in it, 
And then as we deploy it, we can use runtime variables such as environment properties, such as command line parameters to override things within that jar or war file. 